I have the pleasure and the honor to uh, present Mr. Robert Lieber, Professor of Government and International Affairs at Georgetown University, where he was previously served as Chair of the Government Department and Interim Chair of Psychology. He is the author or editor of 16 books on international relations and U.S. foreign policy. You should have question after. And he has served as an advisor to several presidential campaigns, to the State Department, and to the drafter of U.S. national intelligence estimates. His last, latest book, Power and Willpower in the American Future, Why the U.S. is Not Destined to Decline, has been published by Cambridge University Press. Professor Lieber received his undergraduate education at the University of Wisconsin and earned his PhD at Harvard. He has held fellowships from the Guggenheim, Rockefeller, and Ford Foundation, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He has also taught at Harvard, Oxford, and the University of California. Davis and has been visiting fellow at the Atlantic Institute in Paris, the Brookings Institute in Washington, and Fudan University in Shanghai. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you, Merle, and thank you, Mark, and uh, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, visitors and fellow Washingtonians. Um, let me just offer a, um, an initial observation, then say a few things, and uh, uh, say I'd welcome a few questions. And um, an observation I sometimes make is that, um, uh, although I've lived in Washington a very long time, I've been at Georgetown since the uh, mid-1980s, um, I was born and raised in Chicago, and we Chicagoans and Midwesterners have a, a, a direct, earthy, and pragmatic uh, tradition about us. So when the question period comes, don't hesitate to uh, ask me a tough, direct question. You needn't worry that, um, uh, unlike my uh, East Coast colleagues, you might hurt my feelings. The, um, my uh, topic for today is why, har why hard power matters in a soft power world. Um, the, I note that the conference invitation uh, contains the wording, over the past four years, inter the international community has come to see soft power and cultural diplomacy display a more significant role within U.S. foreign policy and international relations. I think that's, that's right, and certainly um, soft power and cultural diplomacy have mattered a great deal, uh, not just in recent years, but uh, since the end of World War II. Uh, but the uh, soft power and diplomacy matter, uh, otherwise none of us would be here, but the key is how they matter and the foundations on which they rest. I think much of the discussion about soft and hard power is much too um, bifurcated, uh, too artificial, and doesn't sufficiently take into account the way in which these two dimensions of international uh, involvement interact and uh, reinforce uh, each other. Let me note that if only soft power mattered, we might all be here uh, speaking Italian or Swedish, and I could stop now and simply say to you, ciao. <laughs> it means hello to. Okay. So hello and goodbye. I can also do that in Chinese and German and a few other languages. French. Um, but how soft power and public diplomacy are used and the assumptions about them matter a great deal. Let me give you a negative example. Um, I've taken part in public diplomacy um, as a, a visiting American speaker uh, for more than three decades, beginning really uh, at the end of the 1970s when I was spending a sabbatical year in Paris working on a book. And I spoke every year or two for the, um, what was then the U.S. Information Agency, or briefly under the Carter administration, something called ICA. Um, which was really USIA under a different name, and then it was USIA again, and so forth. But a critical juncture occurred at the end of the 1990s, and I think it reflected a disastrous miscalculation on the part of the Clinton administration. In the late 1990s, as you'll recall, talk about the world as a global village was uh, de rigueur. 
um, uh, CNN had happened. Cell phones were becoming ubiquitous. Cable modems uh, had uh, been making their impact. And in a deal cut between the State Department, led by Madeleine Albright, with the uh, agreement of the President, and with Jesse Helms, then the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the USIA was abolished and its functions were folded into the State Department. The logic was, well, in a world that's a global village, we don't really need USIA, we don't really need the formal programs that it was uh, involved with, with CNN and the internet and all that, um, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, and it was a disaster for public diplomacy. Those functions uh, melded into the State Department uh, really tended to atrophy, and people involved in them have off were often very dedicated, still are, and have worked very hard at it, but they lost the autonomy and priority they had and I think it's one of the misunderstandings that in a globalized world, uh, the um, uh, having a conscious sense of how to do these things with some real political sense um, is, uh, is not to be taken uh, for granted. Let me cite uh, no less an authority than Kofi Annan, and here I'm switching slightly from public diplomacy to diplomacy per se, because when you talk about diplomacy, uh, diplomacy, as has been said, skillful diplomacy, is the art of telling someone to go to hell in such a way that he looks forward to the trip. <laughs> uh, let me note that under both Republican and Democratic presidents, for the most part, American diplomacy has lacked that finesse <laughs> that one would want. Well, Kofi Annan, uh, back in the early, um, in, the, uh, uh, in the 1990s, when he was Secretary General, dealing with one of the repeated crises involving uh, the late unlamented Saddam Hussein, remarked at one point that diplomacy can do many things, but diplomacy backed by force can do many more things. And I think we oughtn't to lose um, sight of that. I know many people involved with cultural diplomacy, culture itself, uh, traditional diplomacy, are often uncomfortable with power, not least American power, but it's very important to appreciate that power, hard power, and I, I have a, a liberal definition of an encompassing definition of what hard power represents, is the foundation on which much of soft power really rests. So what do I mean by hard power? I don't just mean military force or power projection or weaponry, although those things matter, but the observation that the United States possesses very deep material and social strengths that blend with and sustain soft power, not only American soft power, but a more decent world where um, uh, interchange, regional stability, uh, cultural um, involvements, um, efforts at uh, humanitarian intervention, and other such noble efforts can take place, including multilateral institutions and arrangements. Now I'll note here, and this relates to my new book, uh, that if you go to the web and type in the words American Decline, the last time I did it in Google, it produced 360 million hits. So there's a, an assumption among the chattering classes and lots of others that the U.S. is in an uh, inevitable de historical decline, often based on crude analogies with the rise and fall of the Roman Empire or the rise uh, and fall of the British Empire. Well, my um, message here is um, don't sell short uh, you'll be making a big mistake. As I argue in the book, there is a lot going on and there's a tendency to wildly overinterpret what has often been a cyclical process. Throughout America's entire history, there have been uh, periods in which people have said the U.S. is done for in some way or another. After, during and after, immediately after the American Civil War, in the 1930s when many people understood or believed that uh, America and indeed the liberal democracies were finished and the way of the future was either represented by the Soviet model or by the model of fascism as evident in uh, a number of places, most path pathologically Nazi Germany. But the elements uh, of hard power, as I say, include not just military strength, but the depth and breadth of the American economy, the role of the dollar, uh, entrep arch entrepreneurship and competitiveness, uh, 
which are subtle and intangible but matter enormously. If you ask yourself, where will the next Googles, Apples, Intels, Amazons, and so on come from, I'd be willing to bet they come from the United States, parenthesis, or maybe Israel, but not from Berlin or Shanghai or Moscow. Um, I'd be willing to wager on that. Uh, technology in the U.S. Uh, is in a class by itself. If you think of American science, medicine, research and development, Nobel Prize awards, um, and also in a post-industrial economic world, and one that's very globalized, it turns out that the U.S. has enormous advantages that are likely to be increasingly evident in international economic uh, chessboards in the coming years. The rise of the so-called BRICS, that is the emerging economies. Uh, BRICS, obviously, the acronym most of you know, standing for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. The uh, rise in middle class and upper middle class populations creates a demand for precisely the kinds of technology, products, and culture that the U.S. has a comparative advantage with in exporting and developing. Whether you're talking about uh, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, biotechnology, modern aircraft, entertainment, or medium, low, and high cultural products as well. Moreover, ask yourself where There we have an example of high tech at work. <laughs> In the playoffs, always bet against, always, never bet against the U.S., always bet against Dallas and Germany. <laughs> anyway, I said I was from Chicago. <laughs> the um, uh, other things I, I can point to, um, America's population and demography. People talk about the size of China and India, both of which have had extraordinary development in the last generation. In the case of China, a development which is unparalleled in human history. But nonetheless, both societies have enormous problems that make it a grave mistake to assume, especially in the case of China, that one can simply extrapolate the dramatic straight line of their economic development and modernization over the last three decades. The U.S. has the world's third largest population and will continue to hold at least third place in that. It has a f more favorable demography than any of the countries I've mentioned, bar none. We have our problems, which are very real, about entitlement programs, debt and deficit, and the retirement of the baby boomers. But when you look at American birth rates and the population pyramids, we're in better shape than other countries, including China, over the next generation. We have natural resources, which are the envy of the world, and only in the last six months to a year has public attention turned to what is a dramatic renaissance in American energy production, thanks to technological breakthroughs in natural gas and oil through fracking, three-dimensional subsurface imaging, and horizontal drilling. The U.S. situation in energy in natural gas and oil is being transformed. It's not a silver bullet for the entire economy, but it has enormous implications in terms of the balance of payments, competitiveness, advantages for American businesses, exports, and in international terms, and you can read about it, somebody's got an op-ed on it, I think today in the newspapers about the international consequences of America's energy revolution. Uh, it's another, yet another strong element in what America is and does that reinforces uh, assumptions about the American future. Note as just one uh, sign, if you look at the U.S. and China, the kind of simplistic view is that China is replacing the United States as the world's leading power. Well, don't bet on it. The um, uh, American universities across the country are uh, enrolling tens of thousands of Chinese foreign students, especially in science and technology, but even in undergraduate programs and so forth. Um, a striking percentage of Chinese, wealthy Chinese, have seen to it to secure foreign passports um, and to uh, arrange themselves a possible uh, alternative to being in China. There are any number of public opinion polls 
taken in China by um, some uh, business outfits that uh, suggest a good deal of unease there. And again, there is the cultural attraction of the United States. The U.S. still, with all the problems in our immigration programs, and they desperately need reform, is a magnet for immigrants and still is. One secret to that is that the U.S. has a unique absorptive capacity. If you um, uh, emigrate uh, to a, uh, a foreign country, uh, only, almost only in the U.S., maybe Australia is another example, is it possible within a short period of time, to use the American example, to be as American as apple pie? Um, if you look around at your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues, for those of you who are Americans, you will be struck by how many of them were born elsewhere or educated elsewhere, have, uh, are here now, and how many of them, again, have become essentially American as apple pie, how they see themselves and how they're seen by their neighbors. It's a contrast with other societies where you and your ancestors could have lived in that society for decades or generations or centuries, and suddenly conflict occurs, the, soci the um, uh, society begins to disintegrate, and ethnic warfare, religious warfare, cultural warfare erupts, and people find themselves fleeing for their lives or worse. The, um, the, uh, you may be uncomfortable with hard power, but it sustains a world in which soft power can matter. And here I want to offer one observation and then a couple of quotes. The personal observation is my father, who was born in Lithuania in the um, uh, Russian Empire of those days, and his family emigrated to the United States in 1921 on the sister ship of the Titanic, the SS Olympia. And um, before he passed away, he left a memoir, and he refers in it to how he and his family and all the other people immigrating to America at the time regarded America as, as they said in Yiddish, de goldene Medina, the golden land. Ninety years have passed, but some of the same sentiment, I think, still exists in large parts of the world. And it suggests something about America's attractiveness that remains unique. That's not only based on American culture and soft power, but it represents the wide array of things I've referred to and not least America's absorptive capacity. I don't mean to romanticize it because the first generations who came to America and still do often have it very rough. But if you talk to your taxi drivers or the people who park your car or the people who clean your offices, they'll often have enormous aspirations for their children. They won't all make it, but there's that sense of possibility which remains unique. Now, back to the broader theme, a quote before I wrap up. The late Sam Huntington, nearly 20 years ago, made the following observation. It's one I share, and I think it says something about the way hard power sustains a soft power world. Huntington wrote in, in 1993, a world without U.S. primacy will be a world with more violence and disorder and less democracy and economic growth than a world where the United States continues to have more influence than any other country in shaping global affairs. The sustained international primacy of the United States is central to the welfare and security of Americans and to the future of freedom, democracy, open economies, and international order in the world. Then I want to finish with quotes from uh, Alexis de Tocqueville and Winston Churchill, again, about the United States' role. Tocqueville, I think, captures it even a little better than Churchill does. In, in his Democracy in America, written in the 1830s, he wrote, quote, the great privilege of the Americans does not consist in being more enlightened than any other nations, but in, but in being able to repair the faults they may commit, unquote. He's touching on American exceptionalism, which to this day is a widely misunderstood concept, even, I should say, misunderstood by President Barack Obama. Um, Winston Churchill, uh, almost uh, channeling Tocqueville uh, sometime in the la about five decades ago, six decades ago, commented, quote, Americans can always be counted on to do the right thing after they have exhausted all of their possibilities, unquote. <laughs> I think those quotes of Huntington, of Tocqueville and Churchill capture the importance of the United States, the importance of hard power broadly defined, as I've done, 
in sustaining soft power, not only in terms of American soft power, but a kind of world in which soft power matters more and more. Thanks for listening, and I welcome your questions. Excellent. What's the next question? <laughs> but, but you focus only on American values mm -hmm. uh, and American assets mm -hmm. as if other powers didn't have values and assets as well. Mm -hmm. Primacy does not depend on the U.S. only. Mm -hmm. Even if the U.S. does not decline, mm -hmm. the U.S. cannot achieve what it wants in foreign mm -hmm. policy on mm -hmm. many uh, mm -hmm. stages. So in some spheres, it has already declined. Even if it remains a major power in the mm -hmm. world, the signs of decline are already there. The U.S. cannot mm -hmm. even tell Turkey mm -hmm. what to do or what to say. It's a good question, and there's some very good answers to it. I'll be very concise. One argument is, frankly, and again, uh, I wish I would brought a copy of my book. The short answer is, read my book. <laughs> you can, my book is Power and Willpower in the American Future, Why the U.S. is Not Destined to Decline. Uh, it, um, ever since it came out in May, Amazon carries it, has been carried at 35% off. $16.60 on Amazon. And for you, I'll even autograph it. It makes a great present for um, uh, immigrants, journalists, uh, weddings, bar mitzvahs, whatever. Um, no, seriously, for one thing, there's a tendency to see Americans' role during the Cold War or during the first decade after the end of the Cold War as impregnable. But I can give you a list of 20 things during the Cold War where the U.S. constantly had reversals. The U.S. lost China. The, the outfit we supported. We fought to a standstill in Korea and lost 37,000 dead. We fought to a standstill in Vietnam and lost 57,000 dead. We were constantly facing getting poked in the eye by General de Gaulle, among others, um, and faced reversals of all kinds. You've seen Argo. Think of what happened in uh, Iran at that time with the seizure of the American embassy hostages. American primacy and power didn't always mean, and doesn't mean now, getting everything you want every time. It means being, having a certain degree of influence. Moreover, America has always been uh, multilateral in what it seeks to do. All of the major international institutions that exist today were largely shaped or created by the United States. Whether you're talking about the World Trade Organization, NATO, the International Monetary Fund, the, Fund, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, and so forth. You need to keep that in mind. Also, Power is about more and less, not either or. The U.S. margin vis-a-vis -vis other competitors, say, uh, in the decade after the end of the Cold War, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, was like this. Since then, there's been some attrition. The U.S. has encountered as any number of problems, as we always do. America's history is full of replete with economic crises. There were five major financial and economic crises in the 19th century, not to mention the crisis of the 1930s and so forth. So there's been some attrition in the U.S. position, and the Chinese have moved up, but the gap still remains enormous. A last example, and I think it's a source of a major intellectual confusion. If you read Paul Kennedy, not least his op-eds, and others like him, you'll see that they're drawing an explicit or implicit analogy with the rise and fall of the British Empire. But exactly 100 years ago, Britain, which still ruled a quarter of the world, had been overtaken in population, GNP, steel production, military potential, by Germany and the U.S., and the Russians were fast, fast catching up. If you look at the numbers today, and you measure GDP, as the World Bank recommends for international comparisons, not by purchasing power parity, which doesn't work for those comparisons, but by uh, market uh, exchange rates at market prices, the U.S. GDP today is still nearly double that as a percentage of world GDP, roughly 21 percent to 10.5 percent for the Chinese. Moreover, per capita income measured this way puts the U.S. vastly ahead of China. That doesn't mean that China hasn't been transformed, that there isn't a major com great power competitor out there, but I think it's an example of what is a rather materialistic and uh, one-dimensional interpretation of America's status and standing. Thank you. We'll continue here in the front and then we'll go to the side. 
uh, Howard Stouffer, University of New Haven. Um, I, I have no challenge to anything that you said, but, I will, I, but there is one area of weakness for the United States mm -hmm. that is extremely uh, disconcerting, and that is in our education. Mm -hmm. Not so much at the university level, but what's the last time you stepped into a high school? Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen high school students in Russia and China and Indonesia, mm -hmm. throughout the world. They all speak English. Mm -hmm. They all know English. You'd be hard pressed to find a single high school student in the United States uh, when you go into a high school to find one that speaks a foreign language fluently that's not an immigrant, but that's American born. I and, disagree with that last well, statement. You, yeah. you would find, and you'll find that they can't uh, write anymore because mm -hmm. texting has mm -hmm. destroyed the American language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and, and the last thing I was gonna say mm -hmm. is that every time you wanna cut a budget because of our debt crisis, mm -hmm. people like Perry in Texas mm -hmm. and elsewhere mm -hmm. are cutting education. Mm -hmm. The children of our country, of the United States, are our greatest asset, and they are atrophying um, at mm -hmm. the lower levels in the elementary and, and secondary schools, and, and I think that's going to have an impact if we don't reverse it. That's all. I, I both agree and disagree. Um, yes, you agree. <laughs> well, but I, I agree that there are real problems in secondary education. Um, I, but about the causes, I don't agree that the problem is funding. Uh, my kids went to public schools in D.C., um, and did well because they were in the, the only, at the time, the only decent public high schools in Northwest D.C., and they did they just fine. I mean, I got a Ph.D. and a lawyer out of it. And their prom dates, the girls both went to Harvard for their, so on, even though they went to a school that was uh, overwhelmingly minority. But, but wait, um, but there are big problems. D.C. was spending then and now, on a per capita per student basis, more than any state in the country, I think, than Alaska. But the outcomes were not there. I think of my own elementary and grade school education um, and, and high school education in Chicago public schools, which were starved by the Irish Catholic machine that ran the city in those days. And what mattered most had to do with cultural and family matters, coming from intact families who valued reading and education and wanted their kids to straighten up and fly right. You can't quantify a lot of that stuff. I think you're right about the impact of texting and all that. A lot of it's pathological. But, but I also remember from when I was a kid that people used to, the, the older generation would say, oh, the younger generation's going to hell. That's a common theme. I suppose you could probably find it even in the Bible, but I'm not a Bible <laughs> scholar. The other thing is that I think it's certainly true that countries like Germany and France and Britain in their elite institutions do a be far better job of educating their secondary school students. But I will also say that if you're talking about undergraduate education, the Americans do it a lot better than their competitors. Right, but, not, not secondary. but not secondary schools, yeah. Okay, let's continue to the left. Thank can you. you step out a little more here so yeah. I can see you? Is it? Oh, okay. My name is Paula. I'm from La Universidad de los Andes in Colombia. My question is, do you consider then that the United States is still the empire that it was thought in the uh, early 1990s? I totally reject the concept of empire. It reeks of vulgar Marxism or vulgar Marxism-Leninism. Um, seriously, and let me give you an example. When uh, Hungary uh, and Czechoslovakia, when Hungary sought to withdraw from the Warsaw Pact in 1956, the Soviets crushed the Hungarian Revolution in blood. When our friend General Charles de Gaulle announced in 1965 he was withdrawing France from the integrated military command of NATO, the Johnson administration screamed bloody murder, but when the time came, the NATO headquarters in, near Paris was uh, wound up and they had to move to Brussels, which is much less attractive, but it has very good food and beer. Um, it's just but one example. The U.S. is... Uh, has enormous influence um, and power, but it is not an empire in any meaningful sense of the word. Words matter. The English language is a powerful tool, and the use of empire, when you're contrasting it with the Soviet Union, um, the Roman Empire, the British Empire, and so on, with the exception of a couple of cases in Central America um, a, um, in past uh, eras, the U.S. cannot accurately be called an empire in any way, shape, or form. It's a complete misuse of the term. Thank you. Is there a final question? Or? Okay, let's go. Um, 
Hello, my name is Thea Richard. I'm here from Washington, D.C., working in international exchange. And um, based on your um, title of your uh, presentation, and obviously the assumption mm -hmm. the United Nations does not have a military or backing, but if it were to have that backing, mm -hmm. would we have a different world or a different environment or maybe policies actually being enforced or implemented? Um, there's a problem of is and ought. The, uh, how you would like the world to be, but how it actually is. And you can't get to the ought unless you focus on what the is is, to quote a president. <laughs> the, the, um, the problem is that the United Nations uh, is really the Security Council. And the Security Council requires the agreement of the five permanent members. Uh, throughout most of its operation, the U UN has been paralyzed on the really big questions by lack of agreement among the five permanent members. You can see it in play in Syria now, where what the Syrian regime is doing with the active support of Russia and Iran is an absolute outrage. But Russia and China will not allow the, Syria, the uh, UN to do anything in terms of responsibility to protect, which is a UN mandate from 2005. So, yeah, a lot of what matters in world affairs happens multilaterally and through international institutions. But my point is, a lot of that doesn't work unless the U.S. is actively engaged and involved. And it doesn't work, in the case of the U.N., unless the Russians and Chinese agree to play ball. And they've acted mainly as spoilers uh, in the contemporary world. Okay, Professor Lieber, a final, final question, and then we'll have to bring it to a conclusion. The panel discussion will begin. Professor Lieberman, oh, no, Lieber, Lieber. 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 Mm -hmm. You know, I speak two languages, two and a half. Which ones? English, German, and I had French in high school, mm -hmm. but that's years ago, and uh, when I went into the Army, uh, I wanted to go to France, but de Gaulle kicked all of the Americans out of France, so there you go. they sent me to Germany. Yeah, we didn't invade, we didn't invade, we didn't try to... Um, um, I mean, Emir Naj, the Prime Minister of Hungary, uh, well, wait a was, I'm was supposed hung to ask by the... the yeah. here. <laughs> wait a minute. We didn't hang De Gaulle. All right. Listen. You know, you got a couple of things here, because yesterday someone made a statement, one of the speakers, and I just addressed a couple of issues. Mm -hmm. You said your, your father came over on the SS Olympia, which mm -hmm. was a sister ship of the Titanic. Correct. In, in 1921. 21. August of 1921. Which was less than 60 years after the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. Right. Now, I think it's a little, it would be a little bit disingenuous mm -hmm. to suggest that immigrants who came here would face difficulties, which they undoubtedly did, and still do to this day, as you mm -hmm. indicated, but not to also recognize that these people who were emancipated mm -hmm were living under the most terrible of conditions mm -hmm. before, during, and after mm -hmm. the arrival of your father. Mm -hmm. All right. And people don't want to address that issue. Now, as to the United States mm -hmm. being an empire or not, if we look at, let's say we look at the Roman Empire, I think perhaps its furthest extension of its military and political mm -hmm. power would have been into Britain or, mm -hmm. or Ireland. United States has hundreds of bases all around the world. Now, what are the prerequisites or which would determine whether or not a country would be an empire or not? I think that in most cases, if we would have defined the Roman, Holy Roman Empire as being an empire, which we so designate, then the United States would fall into those particular parameters, if you follow what I'm saying, what I'm suggesting. One other thing. I went to the United States military November the 18th, 1966. Mm -hmm. Did you fight in Vietnam? I was, I'm a Vietnam veteran. Mm -hmm. I tried not to fight. Now, what thank I know. Thank you for your service. You don't have to thank me. It was, the war was wrong. Uh, don't I oppose the war. Uh, don't, okay, good. Well, that's good. We, we unite on that. I'm going to be very brief. <laughs> About, around, the question, <laughs> around the question of education. Mm -hmm. What I noticed, what I noticed was that most of the American soldiers didn't know what the war was all about. Mm -hmm. They had never heard of Vietnam, didn't know about 
Cambodia, didn't know, it, didn't know about Laos, didn't know about Thailand. So, and even today, and I'm a member of the, of, of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and I've been in the anti-war movement for over 40 mm -hmm. years, and what I've noticed is, and what has been pointed out in, in, in numerous press articles, is that a lot of the soldiers didn't know about Iran, they didn't know about Iraq. I think it's a very dangerous thing to put people in a situation where they go out and are offensive in their operations and they don't even know what they're fighting about. I think that's a serious deficiency and continues to plague the U.S. Right, let me respond because I know Mark is okay, going to have through. a baby if we don't bring this to him. No, he's not, he's not going to. It's impossible for him to have a baby. We know this. Um, I agree and disagree. Um, first, the, I agree with you about the terrible treatment and condition of African Americans during slavery and afterward. But I will also say about that, that, that democracy is always a work in progress. And the, the striking thing is that America's ideals and evolution over the centuries are remarkable and you can't find uh, another country, I think, with a, a history and a trajectory um, about which you could say quite the same thing. And I think rather than point to the sins of the past, which are very real, let's not forget, I mean, most of us have seen Lincoln, which is an Academy Award nominee. Um, Americans fought a civil war in which 660,000 people died uh, to make, in effect, to end slavery. Um, that's not nothing, and you can't just ignore that. And the effort to, to deal with um, the treatment of African Americans over the years uh, was a long, difficult, torturous road. But the fact we have an African American president says something about the openness of American society. You would have great difficulty finding that, something like that, elsewhere. About the rest of what you've said, I emphatically disagree. Um, in Vietnam, we had a drafty army. I think the Vietnam War was a mistake. It would have been desirable if a uh, democratic, independent South Vietnam could have survived. It might have under other circumstances, but it didn't. Um, but the, uh, we fought that war with a drafty army. The draft was done away with in 1973. We have a volunteer army, and it says something about the United States that despite more than a decade of two very grinding, frustrating wars, that army has held together, is one of the, perhaps the best in the world, and with all our imperfections, um, the uh, U.S. has a fair amount to be proud of, whether or not you think the Iraq War was a, was a mistake. Um, so I don't agree with the kind of sweeping condemnation that uh, is implicit in your, in your second question. The other thing is, Life is imperfect. America is imperfect. There's an old joke that goes, how's your wife? And the reply is, compared to what? I told you I was from Chicago. And you win. I'll stop at this point. Thanks for listening. Thank you very, very much, Professor Lieber.